Hey, how are you doing guys? Lewis here with Fedivo. Today we have a different type of video. It's more of an informal fireside chat talking about who the red Komodo is truly for. So if you've been thinking about buying a red Komodo, or perhaps you're on the fence of selling the red Komodo, I think this video will be a great watch. I've been using the camera for near enough a year now, and I have some thoughts about it. In fact, this will be my final week with the red Komodo. So if you stick around, you're gonna find out why. I would say I'm quite a journeyman cameraman when it comes to cameras. I don't always stick with the same camera for several years. Um, I'm not a fanboy of any particular brand, um, whether it's Red, Canon, Sony, I've near enough bounced around the majority of them. A lot of the time that is down to my job as a technology writer. It's important for me to keep up with the current technology. And I often find there's a big difference between having a camera to review for two weeks versus having a camera for six months to a year. Uh, the list pretty much goes on of the amount of cameras that I've used over the years. Um, so I think it gives me a pretty good base point to talk about my experiences with the Red Komodo so far. Now, a year ago or so, um, I had had the C300 Mark III for a number of years. And guys, without a doubt, that was my favorite camera I'd ever used. From its usability, the ergonomics of its ease of use, uh, ISO, magnification, LUT viewer, peaking. There was all buttons for every single operation that you needed on the side of the camera. You did not have to jump into the menu like you would with a mirrorless camera or like you would with the Red Komodo. However, there was one aspect of the C300 Mark III which always bugged me and it was its image. I hate to say this because I hate it when people say it them, uh, themselves, but it just didn't feel cinematic. There was an element to the C300 where it was a very, very great image, but it didn't feel like something that you would be watching on TV. It didn't feel like something that you would be watching um, on film. Again, that was a 10 grand camera. It had all the bells and whistles on it, but the image, it didn't sing to me. Um, and I found Canon RAW in comparison to the likes of say Blackmagic RAW, um, not that great it wasn't as versatile so of course when the red komodo came out there was a lot of fanfare about having a red camera as accessible in price as some of the other mid-range cameras on the market because historically red cameras are not cheap um, in 2012 they had the red one mx and they were discontinuing the line and any battle tested reds they had in stock they decreased the price from $22,000, I think, to $4,000. So immediately I was like, yeah, the phrase actually back then was 4, 4K for 4K, um, because in 2012, you know, DSLRs weren't giving you 4K images. And um, that was a great camera. So the fact that there was the possibility of picking up a new red for 6,000 pound or, or hereabouts, uh, was very appealing to me. But likewise, when the cost of a camera has been significantly reduced, it was likely that there was gonna be functions from the camera missing, which there is. But the trade-off is you have that luscious red codec, the filmic highlight roll-off, and of course the 16-bit color data, which was one of the biggest factors that I was missing from the C300 Mark III. So first we have to talk about the price. The outrigger handle is a must have in my opinion, because otherwise you're trying to hit record on the side button there. And um, it can be quite tricky, especially if you've got it on a shoulder rig and you're kind of like looking to focus with the lens, or if you've got one hand on a rig like that, that's a little tricky. Having the outrigger handle, in my opinion, is a must because you're able to not only have a secured placement with the camera, but with the record button by here, it's like instantaneous record. It, it's, it's a must have, but this is an additional 500 pounds onto uh, the Komodo itself. Secondly, as it comes in the box format, you're gonna wanna equip it with a cage. 
so you can start attaching various accessories. Because while there is a few mountain plates, uh, mountain areas on the camera itself, it's gonna be safer for the structure of the camera to be mounting things onto the cage, not necessarily the camera itself. Again, that's gonna be another 100 to 200 pounds depending on the brand that you've come with. And a lot of people are gonna want a top handle because we'll get to this in a moment when it comes to attaching a monitor or audio inputs. Um, it's not practical to kind of work with this camera without a uh, top handle. Then we get to our first issue. The LCD screen on the red, I don't know if you can even see this on the camera. On the Komodo, it's very small. And when you boot up the camera, and um, actually I'll tell you what, let me just turn this on and um, I'll show you guys while we're waiting. Um, you have a LCD screen but that LCD screen is not the full width of what you'll be viewing with your image. You have a lot of um, image parameters, such as the um, if the highlights or shadows are um, overexposed, underexposed, as well as a few camera operational properties. So they're filling a good portion of the LCD screen. So let's see if we can get in here. I don't think I can show you because of this top handle on, but while this is the LCD, the image viewing plane starts by here. So in fact, you only, it's not record, you only really have that much of an image. So therefore, it is imperative that you need to use this camera with a field monitor. That in itself has now changed the dynamics of this camera while it is a box shape and you can use it, you know, like this. If you're out in a sunny environment, or there's, you're not shooting someone up close. It is next to impossible, in my opinion, and in, in my experience, to get some solid focus because you just cannot see what you're viewing. Now, there are a number of monitors out there on the market that you can use with this camera. However, if you want to use the um, built-in functionality of monitors where you can control the camera through the monitor, um, the price soon quickly goes up. I think I've got the small HD seven inch uh, Indy seven for this so I can control all of the parameters of the camera itself through the monitor. That in itself is an extra like 2,000 pound. Um, so that was instantaneously an extra 2,100 for the monitor with the touch screen with the control functionality, 500 for the um, outrigger handle. And then of course you need power. Now it's like, this is common sense, right? It doesn't really matter what sort of camera you're buying. You need to buy additional accessories for it, except if you are buying the C300 Mark III, that came with pretty much everything you needed. Uh, you need to buy additional accessories for it in order to rig it up, tailor it to your standard. But it's important to know that when you purchase the Red Komodo, you pretty much get the Red Komodo, um, and RF to EF mount adapter and um, a power unit for at home power so you don't have to use the, um, uh, the batteries themselves. But the accessories for RED, because it is a high valued brand, are very expensive. So you're going to be looking at an additional expense when it comes to just the media, uh, the, the power itself. And before you know it, guys, this has come from like a £6,000 investment vastly pushing towards 10,000 and you kind of haven't even got out to, to, to start shooting yet. So I think that's really imperative, um, especially when it comes down to the screen. You do need an external monitor for this. So those factors for myself, I think are very detrimental if you're trying to keep a low cost um, basis down for shooting with a um, mid-range camera. Again, you know, it's common sense. You're gonna have to buy a lot of different um, uh, tools and accessories when you're kitting out your camera, but with RED, that cost just jumps up quite highly. Next, let's talk about its shooting um, factor. So it does come with autofocus, which was a new for RED. And I think that the price market of the RED Komodo is enticing to the self shooters who might have come from the Sony FX line or perhaps the, the Canon C300 line, or even just coming from the mirrorless camera world where autofocus is just like a standard tool in this day and age. The autofocus in the RED Komodo is 
good in some circumstances, but it's not as practical as using a Sony FX6. You're not gonna get that level of responsiveness that you might be accustomed to. So for myself, um, and I mean, like this is how I grew up. It was more or less weird for me to go into an autofocus world. It's gonna be a lot of manual focusing. With those factors, let's also talk about its practicality with its menu functionality. I think this is one of the better menus that we've seen on a RED camera. It's very intuitive. Um, everything's laid out very neatly. Accessing it though, in a quick, sufficient manner, isn't that practical. There's a menu button, an up and down button, select, and a play button. Th that's all we can access from the camera uh, body itself. Everything else needs to be done touch screen either through a monitor that has um, uh, red functionality or on the, the LCD itself. And as noted, this LCD is very small. If you've got big fingers like myself, I know it sounds silly, but navigating the menu can be quite tedious. And I think one of the more frustrating elements of this camera is when it comes to skimming through video clips. That in itself, um, if you're someone like myself who, you know, maybe we're doing one of these types of videos where there's a lot of talking for 10 to 15 minutes and there might be at one point that we need to review something from a very specific time, navigating to that moment, it's not intuitive. Um, it's not helpful. Whereas, you know, on the C300 Mac 3, for example, it's very easy just to navigate to that play clip and skim through using the joystick on the, um, the external monitor. This just does not like to cooperate in that manner. Again, the menu is very neatly laid out. I think once you memorize where a lot of elements are, you can quickly get to it, but I still find, you know, nearly a year later, I'm still clicking the wrong thing down to the fact that my fingers are large and this screen is incredibly small. Now, if you have come from the mid-range camera world and you are just looking for that, you know, that 16-bit color information, uh, the vast range of dynamic range that is associated with the RED brand, you have to remember that this isn't necessarily, despite its size, a run-and-gun camera in the way that you might be familiar with, again, with the C300 or the, the Sony line, where you basically turn the camera on and the boot up is in next to no time. The boot up for this camera, um, I'm not gonna do it at the moment because uh, the camera is currently on, but I will pull up a number on the screen. It's a good number of seconds. Uh, it's at least over 10 seconds to get the camera on. And then we have um, information on the top of the screen, the T&E, which is where the sensor is ready to start receiving information. If it's not, you might get some odd color casts. So there's, no way that if you're you know driving down the road and you see something spectacular and you need your camera on in that moment this is not going to do it for you so it might seem like for the last 10 minutes i've really just ragged on at the red komodo but that isn't the case um as noted it produces very beautiful images however it's work the way that the red komodo has its workflow um, and how you need to operate the camera isn't for a shooter like me it isn't for someone who quite often needs to take the camera out of the bag, boot it up, start shooting. For the self-shooters who are also um, relying on built-in NDs, autofocus, those sort of elements which have become commonplace in mid-tier cinema cameras over the last three to four years, I don't think this camera is for you either. If you are an aspiring DP, or perhaps you are an established production unit and need a B cam, but just don't necessarily have the resources to purchase another higher range camera, this camera is gonna be for you. When you have to integrate it into a professional workflow where a boot time of 15, 20, 30 seconds isn't that big of a big deal, and likewise, you're used to offloading terabytes of data and have a system built for that, this camera really fits into a professional-based workflow. I think where people are finding the mistake is that because of its price range and its comparability to the likes of the FX6 or the, C, uh, the Canon C70, they might think it fits and works within that realm. And I really don't think it does. I think 
you need to look at the RED Komodo as a professional cinema camera that lives within that professional cinema camera ecosystem, but it's just been truncated for a B cam, an action cam, a drone cam. So the um, cutting between that footage and say like the, the v wrapped or whatever it may be, um, is seamless. Uh, that's where I am with this camera. Beautiful imagery. The red Kodak is the red Kodak. You're always gonna get like a really great image from it. The highlight roll off really screams filmic quality, but the way that you have to use and live with the camera isn't for someone like me. And I think if you've perhaps grown up um, or grown with the DSLRs and the mirrorless cameras over the last few years and are looking to take that leap into a camera like this, I also think this camera isn't for you. So that's where I am with that. Um, stay tuned, I guess, to see what I'm gonna be purchasing next. But I've been Lewis with Fedivo. Uh, let us know if you enjoy these more informal chat videos, kind of like a one-person podcast. Uh, and I'll catch you guys soon.